Okay, so I think I'll just get started. I'm gonna introduce um, the series in a way first, um, and then we'll get stuck in and I'll introduce Nicole and then Nicole's gonna show a few slides and then we'll start dive into a conversation. So um, I'm Abby Rose. I'm the CEO of VitaCycle. Uh, for those of you who don't know, we make apps that support observation as a key tool for understanding what works on a specific farm or vineyard. Um, and I think many of you here may already use or may be familiar with SectorMentor, which is our app for vineyards. Um, and SectorMentor makes it easy to, to predict yields, monitor ripeness, as well as understand soil health and biodiversity, which is something we're working on with Nicole. Um, and then track vineyard activities block by block and much more. So mm. the reason I wanted to acknowledge that in the beginning is because in many ways, this observational approach and learning from trends in your own vineyard um, that Sector Mentor supports, that's kind of at the core of regenerative farming. Um, and so we have the privilege of our customers and collaborators also being some of the most amazing regenerative advisors and practitioners. And um, Nicole Masters, um, and then Tamara Regen Ben, and then Dan Rinke. You know, there's some of those people who completely reoriented the way we think about farming and, you know, what we're committed to at VitaCycle, which is building ecology, profitability, and beauty on farms around the world. So today really is about nourishing the discussion. You know, what does it look like to apply these regenerative principles to the UK viticulture industry, as well as further afield, wherever you're tuning in from? Um, and yeah, that's why the Regenerative Viticulture Series was born. Um, and I just also really want to highlight, you know, we can see there's amazing stuff happening all over. Um, and some of the stories Nicole tells me and, um, and, but we couldn't see a centralized place for that conversation to come together around viticulture. So really today is about sharing that knowledge, connecting all the dots, and then also showing that Nicole um, and Ben and Dan, you know, they're people who we can go to as a resource to really learn more going forward if you want to take a more regenerative approach. So as Nicole said, please do ask questions in the Q&A as we go. Um, and we will have time at the end to answer those. And you can also upvote other people's questions if you think they're good. <laughs> um, great. So now I'm going to introduce Nicole. Um, hi, Nicole. <laughs> Um, Nicole Masters is an internationally renowned agroecologist. Um, she's the director of Integrity Soils and yeah, the Integrity Soils team are brilliant. They're a collection of regenerative coaches. Um, they work with individual producers as well as delivering training for different organizations and advisors on building healthy soils and regenerative systems. And one thing I'd say that I really love about your approach is that it's really, really practical. Um, and I really appreciate that always. Um, mm -hmm. So if you haven't heard of Nicole before, definitely read her book, For the Love of Soil. Yeah, I have a copy too. <laughs> always on hand. <laughs> always on hand. <laughs> um, and also I really recommend her course, Soil Health Foundations. Um, that's a brilliant way into the thinking as well. Um, so we'll send through links to both of those after this for everyone who's interested. Um, and today our focus of the conversation will be on building soil health in vineyards. Mm -hmm. So Nicole, I was going to hand over to you and you could tell us a little bit about a case study. Yeah, I'm just going to, I'm just going to go straight down the lines and um, yeah, please ask your questions as we go. Thanks, Abby. That was a really nice introduction. Um, yeah, so I have a team that are in Australia and New Zealand who are working one on one with coaching. Pretty, we work in pretty much every sector. Um, I'm going to share a case study with you now that was my first client. So in 2006, I, I had been um, teaching for about four years around regenerative and, you know, mycorrhizae and soil health. And he really, uh, Bruce Nimmin is his name, at Kokako Vineyards, really pushed me to um, step out into the consulting realm, which I must say um, I really struggled with and I still kind of struggle with you know, the, the tell me what to do. Um, and really how we work as, a, as an organization now is really around how do we educate and train you to be able to see what are these visual 
um, indicators, what is the SAP saying about your particular system, and then how do we address issues at their root cause? But um, um. but um, <laughs> so what I want to talk about now is is just this one case study, and then you're welcome to ask questions about and how did they do that, and uh, what does it look like. Um, I have not been really based in New Zealand for the past five years, so I'm not up to date totally. Um, like I've had a conversation with Bruce, but um, he's flying, he's good, you know, and this is kind of, for me, what regenerative ag is about is that it's the empowerment of growers and producers so that you're not needing that external support all the time. So the history of the vineyard, um, that it, it was, you know, conventional viticulture when I turned up, they had actually taken on a, um, an area of ground that had been cropped for potatoes. So it had a pretty big history of chemical use, had a lot of, um, had a lot of issues. So what that created were um, problem weeds that were requiring up to five herbicides a year to control. They were putting on really high fertilizer inputs, high disease pressures and uh, really stress problem blocks. So we dug holes, there were no worms, there was no soil structure, um, the system was falling apart. So why they brought me on board really was um, seeing these high input costs and reducing returns. They just couldn't continue to, to grow vines in, in this situation. Really poor visual soil assessments. I wish we'd had soil mentor in those days because it would be incredible to have tracked this, you know. <laughs> Um, they had high vigor blocks, but really poor fruit ripening and the, the, I don't want to say this out loud, but don't tell anyone, but pretty much growing cask wine, you know, box wine, um, which I think you English drink, don't you, but <laughs> not to dismiss it in any way. Uh, and this is some of the gravels they're, they're on, so pretty heavy gravels. Um, those plants there are chicory, so those have actually been introduced. Uh, and then they have some silt loams as well, so a range of soil types. So taking on this regenerative approach, um, starting to introduce some regenerative practices, but the main change really is that mindset, which is changing from feeding biology to feed the vines, as opposed to um, you're trying to bypass microbiology and you're going to you know, force those vines to take in these nutrients and um, drip feed them or do whatever you want to do, but really thinking, how do I stimulate microbiology in order to, to feed the vines? Um, and then anything that was fairly hardcore in terms of um, chemical use, looking at reducing those chemicals or buffering them um, with biological foods like humic acids or fulvic acids. I wouldn't put humic acids on vines, uh, on leaves, by the way. So um, just thinking about soil applications, they removed all their organophosphates within that first year, which was pretty cool. Um, and by 2010, herbicide was actually able to be removed in most areas, except for new establishing blocks, and they shifted to undervine mowing. I know some of you are cringing right now about that, but we'll talk about it. Um, yeah, so within about two years, uh, the trace elements have been removed. Um, all other fertilizers removed, except for a biological stimulant. And um, this is just to give you a view. So. I, they are, um, they have been buying some more land, but basically 100 hectares here of quite a variety of different types of vines. Um, so uh, they've got Chardonnay, Pinot Noir, Pinot Gris, um, and some Savvy. Uh, yeah, so, and so this side where you can see the vines um, just on, on the edge of that hill, that's those, those, um, those can be quite silty. And then further down the road that you can't see, we've got some really, really heavy, heavy gravels. So the results from adopting this soil health practices, they saw a reduction in interblock inter variation. And actually um, we saw that variation, like looking down the vines, start to see really, really even growth. The ripening um, became much more consistent and seeing that extreme vigor reduced, which is always interesting to me. Like we see vines that don't grow well, grow well, and the ones that overgrow, um, reduce. So we, we start to see um, much better vine management. So eliminated or reduced uh, all those nutrient-based deficiencies, um, saw a massive change in water stress uh, because now we've got soils that it can actually hold on to water. There had been issues with mealybug when I arrived um, and what, what was so interesting was seeing that the mealybug moved from the vines into the understory mixes, so moved into the clover. And 
If it's in the clover, we don't care. You know, if mealybugs there, that's fine. And starting to see earthworms. And it's always so interesting to me, like we can do these programs and growers get the most excited about earthworms. And I think there's something really funny about it. It's like you start to connect and I guess earthworms are the visible part and, you know, they're feeding all, all the bacteria and the fungi and the protozoa, you know, they, they are kind of one of our apex predators as such. So easy to see that we're, we're starting to shift um, that situation. Their spray program, I've actually got numbers that we could put to this, but I'm not going to, but reductions in total herbicide use a reduction in production costs and the reduction in total number of passes. So what does that mean? Um, profitability, right? Uh, I think I covered that. We saw um, uh, improvement in flavor profiles. So they went from basically a cask wine to um, a premium wine. Um, and so that's gonna give you an increased return on investment obviously too. So today they've expanded what they're doing. Um, they found that the savvy Sauvignon Blanc did not cope with having um, grass understory. So that has gone back to um, a herbicide program. But the herbicide, whenever we use a herbicide, I want to see it go in with a carbon. So you want to make sure that the pH of that water or of the mix that you're putting on is exactly where that herbicide is. It's most effective. And you can find that on the chemical company's pages. Um, but also, buffering it with a fulvic acid or um, a worm, like vermicast extract, we're using those. And you can effectively drop your herbicide use by at least 30% just through adding in a bit of fulvic acid. So I really recommend that people do that. Um, we're seeing some pretty neat stuff in terms of that glyphosate um, breaking down. They're using half of the sulfur that's um, used in the industry and they haven't used any botrytocides for 10 years and they haven't had a penalty price drop due to bricks for six years. So it's something they're pretty happy with. So they were actually surveyed um, by MPI, which is a government agency in New Zealand, and they were found to be one of the most cost-effective vineyards in the North Island, which is where the study took place. And these guys have won um, multiple awards for what they're, what they're achieving. So, my, so what are, just some take-home thoughts from that. If your biology isn't being nurtured, then you're going to have to pay for their services. So if that's in nutrients or water or crop health or pests or weeds or disease or whatever, if you neglect your microbial workforce, you're going to have to pay for it somewhere. So systems with a soil health focus are profitable, they're productive, and they're fun. All right. <laughs> Okay, so the vineyard is located in the Hawke's Bay, so North Island, East Coast, so summer dry, um, just outside of what they call the Gimlet Gravels, so New Zealand's largest um, viticulture area. Abby, did you, um, you're muted. There we go. I couldn't unmute myself for a second. It was turned off, sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, great. Thank you. That I think that that uh, case study really sets the scene for what we're talking about here. And I think the you know your point early on there about if you're trying you know feeding the biology and not the vine, mm -hmm. that's kind of from my understanding of what you just shared. Like, is that would you say that's the key principle? Is that like what a soil a soil first or holistic approach is about? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep, yeah, very much so. So looking from the ground up. Um, so like I said, these guys were doing five herbicides a year. We didn't immediately go to undervine mowing. We didn't just let it go. Someone's asked that question. Like um, they had like huge nettles and mallows and um, uh, red root pigweed, fat hen, that sort of stuff that was getting up in the vines and obviously causing all sorts of of issues. So what we were effectively doing is changing that microbial community so that we don't see those things even germinating, like those weeds are gone. And what's interesting, it seems like marshmallow, which I'm sure you guys have, um, loves glyphosate, like it loves it. Um, and I think it's in part because it likes low manganese environments, which is what um, glyphosate creates. So what we're doing is we're changing that understory signal. And if you think about most of those weeds, like if you have dock, um, if you have um, those weeds I just mentioned, your soil system is far too bacterial to even grow vines healthily. So we're trying to grow vines in a soil environment that is not suited 
for viticulture. So we need to be fostering fungi and driving that system much more fungal. So if we were ever to go back and find wild vines, I mean, they've been you know, cultivated for so long. I mean, I think they're one of the oldest crops. You would find that those soil systems are incredibly fungal. Like they're on the edge of, you know, treed environment. Um, they will be in environments that naturally are very high in fungi. So by stimulating fungi, we change that signal. So we just don't see those things like um, dock or nettles. Um, there's a question here, was there a reduction in output yields when the regenerative approach was adopted? Uh, no, totally not. And in fact, I, I think you find that their yields increased because you we, they didn't have the losses to um, botrytis. Now, I don't want to say like this was like a utopian, everything was perfect and we're all dancing down the vines naked with unicorns. That would be cool though. Um, but <laughs> But so um, speaking to them recently, they are having issues with some powdery mildew. So um, I'm, I've been in conversations with them about there are things that we can do about that. So we're going to take some action on the powdery. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's still a system um, that that is evolving. Um, you know, there's still things that we do that send, there's still things that we do that maybe disturb the soil environment. So we've got to always be thinking if, I, if I'm maybe spraying a sulfur or if I'm spraying some heavy synthetic chemical, and these guys are using no, no synthetic um, fertilizers anyway, um, then I'm gonna help repair that soil to, to recover. Um, um, just <laughs> thinking about um, what you- People are so said. funny. Huh? <laughs> People are so funny, don't worry. Oh, yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. That's more of a South Island thing. Um, <laughs> I was just thinking in terms of um, the powdery issue, because I know that's mm -hmm. one of the issues in the UK for sure. Yep. What So what kind of thinking would you apply in order to think about their new powdery mildew issue and how might you go about approaching that? Yeah, so again, we're gonna use all our observations. So using tools to have a look at what's happening under vine, what's happening with, I use, uh, in viticulture, I use a sap meter um, a sap, so sap pH meters, sap EC meters, and refractometers, so bricks. I want to have a look at what is happening in the sap of the vine. Um, and what we find is, as um, what I find typically in vineyards is, so your sap should be 6.4, a pH is 6.4. A lot of vineyards I go to, their pH is around three, three and a half. Look for yourself, all right? So basically you've got like battery acid running through your vines and not quite that bad, but nearly. And, and then what that does then is that sending a signal to, um, or creating the conditions for diseases and pests and certainly weeds. And what's interesting is you can track it. If you apply a fungicide, come back and measure your vines the next day and their pH would have dropped dramatically, right? So a lot of our fungicides and pesticides actually make the vines more vulnerable to um, powdery or um, mildews or whatever you're dealing with, mealybug. Um, even virus. So we've actually cleared up virus in vines uh, using this approach. So River Sun Nursery that I talk about in the book, um, they had a pretty major um, viral outbreak in their rootstock nurseries, which they can't afford to do. Those are very valuable vines. Uh, and we actually got rid of um, virus through, through taking on this approach, which was kind of cool because we're told that that's something that you, you can't do. Uh, so yeah, thinking with, um, with powdery, I'm going to be looking at what, what is happening in, in that plant that's making it more susceptible. And then I'm going to do things to maybe interrupt on the surface. So um, I'm going to say a couple of weird things now, don't freak out. But we've had some really, really good results with seawater. So using seawater and what it does is it, um, it interferes with the pH on that leaf surface and interferes with that, um, the ability of those fungal vectors to infect. Um, and we've also had some good results with milk as well. Um, milk apparently um, kills the spores through UV light by something that it does in the milk. I don't quite understand, but it's worth doing some small trials if you wanted to check it out and you are dealing with some of these softer kind of infections. Um, no, Erin, we're not removing the sodium. We need sodium. And there's only a tiny amount of sodium in seawater. Like, um, we might put on 40 to 100 liters of seawater and you're still talking, like at 100 liters of seawater, you're talking about 35 grams of sodium. You're not gonna, uh, no, 350 grams of sodium total. 
Uh, so you're not going to break the bank by putting on um, seawater. Uh, I wouldn't use it if you had already really, really high salt issues. Um, but um, yeah. Cool. And, oh, and, and there's some bacillus. There's packaged um, bacillus products that are very good at eating powdery. And so is that, you know, if we're thinking about the regenerative approach to, a, let's say, different disease or fungal infections, essentially, um, could you just talk about, you know, do you really always see those as a lack of health in the vine? Do you always see disease as like something, you know, either your soil isn't healthy or your vine isn't, something's going on? And because I think a lot of people see disease as a problem they need to kind of, you know, solve in itself. Yeah, um, absolutely. Yeah, and that's the distinction. So it's, it's getting curious about why and why and why and why. So it might be, um, all right, we're seeing this, issue and I've got a really good book. Um, this one's worth having on your bookshelves if you can get hold of it. It's not an easy book to get hold of, but Mineral Nutrition and Plant Diseases by Don Huber, among other um, scientists. Very interesting in terms of tracking what is the trace element involved with this and then thinking uh, why is that trace element not mobile? So what microbiology just you know, the same as in our human gut, it's that interface that it's microbiology to them making those trace elements available to the plants. So why have we got a lockup uh, with manganese? Or maybe it's a glyphosate problem. Um, or uh, maybe there's an antagonism. So you've got very high magnesium, for instance. You've got some kind of mineral that's locking another mineral up. Um, we got to get curious about that and then support microbiology in terms. And, and there's, no, there's no reason why we wouldn't put on a little bit of trace element. Um, what we used with this program um, to get them through the transition as fast as possible was a commercial product that I really like. That is basically a six week brewing process and they feed like a compost tea, but they're feeding them different trace elements and they feed them seaweed, they feed them fish, they give them molasses and then they're maybe putting a little bit of copper or cobalt or whatever it is. So by the end, you come to that six week, the end of the brew, that biology is all gone dormant. And what it is, is it's just concentrated biological metabolites for the biology that's responsible for releasing manganese or releasing copper or um, whatever it is, phosphorus. Um, yeah, and, and so that was a, it was a soil drench and a foliar application that the vineyard used and then Bruce is pretty good about, I want to, I want to be able to do things myself. So he's now, um, you know, doing different types of soil drenches with, um, and foliars with seaweed, um, fish on the, um, in the understory, um, some organic nitrogen amino acid sources, um, making sure he's addressing his calcium. So everything works off that foundation of calcium. So making sure you have adequate calcium, which I think a lot of you probably have <laughs> a lot of calcium. Yeah. Um, and so if we now move like over to, um, let's say even the concept of weeds and in the vineyard, one of the things I really like in your book is, um, how you use weeds in a, you perceive them in a completely different way. Um, and so maybe you could tell me a little bit about how you understand weeds and, and some of the tools you use to monitor whether you're um, growing weeds or growing a crop. <laughs> mm. Yeah, and so we can actually, those meters I was talking about, you can use those meters to also test your weeds and go, who's in a healthy situation? And what's interesting is what I find is most people are farming for weeds. If we look at the weed population, it is healthier than the crop that you're trying to grow. Um, so we really need to look at why is it that I'm creating the conditions for these weeds to flourish and my vines are struggling. Um, and so all weeds are there to indicate something. <clears throat> in the book, I talk about five main <clears throat> indicators, which might be, <clears throat> you know, <clears throat> have we got bare soil? That's going to that's gonna create, you know, an environment where weeds are going to want to germinate. Have we got low organic matter? Have you got a mineral imbalance, microbial imbalance, or have you got some kind of toxin um, that certain weeds are there to, to mine? So um, I do a lot of, we do a lot of testing and a lot of thinking about weeds, um, starting to see the pattern of where do you see this weed, like the marshmallow in the glyphosate strip, 
um, where is it that we like, you know, we see this specific one growing, maybe it's just a bit wetter or the soils are not breathing so well. Um, <clears throat> so really asking those questions, it, it just, it really just provides so much insight. Mm. <clears throat> Sorry, frogs. Sorry. <clears throat> um, well, I can, I'll ask you a long question to give you some time. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, one thing I, and this is still kind of continuing in this theme and then we can go off on a slightly different theme, but um, many vineyards I visited in the UK, uh, and I certainly know a number of people even asking questions, you know, they were planted on ex arable soils. Um, mm -hmm. And in the mm -hmm. past or recently they've been heavily plowed and then they're heavily plowed at planting as well. Yeah. Um, and then the soil is kept bare for the first year or so, at least to prevent competition. Mm -hmm. So inevitably, you know, you're just starting your life out as a vine or a vineyard manager and the soils are compacted. Um, and in your book, you talk about, you know, if the soils are really, really compacted, applying good soil microbiology isn't going to help because they can't survive anyway. Um, mm -hmm. So what would you suggest in that case? Um, you know, how do you get the biology going? What are those first steps? You know, mm -hmm. is it about subsoiling? Is subsoiling a one-time thing or should you do it every year? What do you, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you're kind of starting with a blank slate in some ways, like you're almost taking that soil back to nearly as primitive as it can be. You've pushed it totally bacterial. You would have lost all your soil structure. Um, you've sped up the bacteria because they're like, oh, yum, there's like all this exposed soil. So their populations go through the roof. And then we see, um, as a result of that, we see the nitrate weeds, so thistles, um, amaranthus family, chenopodium family, uh, they're all um, nitrate, in, in, nitrate indicators. Um, and so, uh, you know, ripping at the start, sure, okay, we're going to open that up, but when we're ripping, I want you to put something down it. So we talked about fulvic acid or humic acids or molasses or fish, something down those rip lines so that the biology um, and plant roots or whatever will actually keep that open. In establishment, still keep ground covered, even though you, you might like leave the vines um, open, keep the interrow with some kind of cover crop. You want to make sure that you're still keeping um, good populations of beneficial insects in that system, um, that you've got those root systems going down. And you know, many, many people are aware of that, you know, ryegrass is an allelopathic plant. It, it stops plant other plant roots you know, growing near it, which is why you don't want it around the vines. But if you put it in the intervine um, row, it'll push roots down. Like it'll encourage um, grapevines that should go down instead of coming laterally. But I, I probably would avoid having ryegrass actually in my mixes. But um, yeah, just having more diversity in that system and then really feeding fungi. So Tim's asked about um, compost. You want the best quality, highest fungal, highest nematode number, compost you can possibly find and you're not going to get that from your municipal waste compost so the stuff that's coming out of the cities that is not the stuff to be putting on your valuable vines so working with someone actually to to get them to make that kind of compost and vermicast so I'm a big fan of worm castings obviously um, but what well not obviously if you don't know who I am that's fine I, I used to be a worm farmer but what comes out of a worm's butt is the elixir of life like it's full of beneficial microbiology, plant growth hormones, um, different metabolites for plant health. Um, for me, that would be a no-brainer. So you can get like a 30% vermicast to 70% compost mix and then use that to really promote um, vine growth. I'm also a big fan of like white wood chips. So think of all of your lovely English deciduous plants, which you kindly brought to New Zealand. Thank you very much. So elm, birch, beech, poplar, willow, species like that. So things that are deciduous that we call soft white woods, chipping those um, and using them as part of my mulch, they are going to feed beneficial fungi. They're going to provide um, water holding capacity. They're going to help stimulate that building of soil structure. And while they're also doing it and they're breaking down, they release carbonic acids, which help to release bound nutrients. So we see a whole lot of really cool benefits from the use of white wood chips. And what's cool about them too, is they don't rob nitrogen from that soil system like pine or spruce or, you know, like your hardwoods or your smelly ones would. Um, that was yeah. the question. 
wasn't it? Yes, yes. <laughs> no, um, and I think, do you, I know you talk about this a bit in the book, but the idea of subsoilings, um, you know, do you see that as something to be done regularly or is that, should it be a one-time thing? Once, yeah. Yeah, just get that system established and then leave it alone. So what we want, what you think about with grapes is that that soil needs to be as disturbed as less as possible. How, how do we create an environment like it was in the wild and, um, you know, on the edge of a, of a forest, you know, there's, it's, it, there's, very, there's a lot of stillness and then that's what really encourages fungi to flourish. If we're out there all the time and we're spraying every day and, um, you know, mowing and everything else that we do, those, those are all disturbance factors. So we want to go, okay, how do we just kind of relax a little bit, chill out, save some money. Chill out, that's the answer to all of this. <laughs> <laughs> Um, okay, so, and finally, just on this compaction issue, um, how can, I think, I think a lot of people, you know, find it difficult to, to know if they have compaction necessarily, or, you know, you kind of assume it, but you're not quite sure. How would you, how can people tell if they have compaction issues? Do we have a lot of gravel soils in the UK or are people mainly on loams with vines? Because, um, yeah, I just ask, because it's tricky when you've got gravels to use a penetrometer. Yeah, no, I haven't seen much of that. No. So uh, yeah, using a penetrometer, walking down into rows and just testing like, is that is that easy to push that down? And even where you've got your tracks, um, <clears throat> your vehicle tracks, we should, that still shouldn't be compacted, all right? Microbiology will open up. And on these soils, we've had a couple vineyards I've worked with on gravels where that soil bounces. It's the weirdest thing. And it's in the book about, we build that soil structure. There's actually more air in there than there is soil, which means it can also hold more water, obviously. But when you walk on them, they're spongy. Um, so if you can't even get a penetrometer into um, the interrow area or um, in between the vines, then yeah, you've got a compaction problem. So you've got to look at what's causing that compaction. And this is my five M's that I talk about. So is it, is it you? quite likely. Uh, is it your management? <laughs> is it a mineral imbalance? Is it a microbial balance? Or is it low organic matter? Those five things interact to create compaction. Okay, start addressing them at the root cause. There's no point coming along and ripping every year. You, you just, well, you're wasting time and money. You're disturbing that system. You're root pruning. You're doing all sorts of stuff. Just chill out and then think about, all right, which of those is, is driving this compaction and then addressing it that way. Hmm. Okay. Um, and also I liked, um, in terms of transitioning away, you talked about that one ranch where you actually applied gypsum um, because the, when the soil is tight um, or it has been compacted, the microbiology can't li live. And so could you explain why you did that? I didn't. So we put gypsum down the drill. So if we, let's say we were, Let's say we're going to do intervine um, cover crops, all right? And you're going to direct drill those. Um, someone asked about sheep before. You could actually graze it pretty hard with sheep when the vines are dormant. And then those, those grazing things, have you seen them? The grazing muzzles for sheep. So when they lift their heads, they can't eat. But when they're down, they can. It's quite cool. Uh, you know, so you could graze hard, come in and direct drill a cover crop. And when we were putting that cover crop down, we put in 30 kgs of gypsum. So we are only affecting where that plant is growing. Uh, we're not trying to put like, you'll see recommendations sometimes for gypsum of like, you know, a ton or a ton and a half. We got a better result with 30 kilos by just putting it down where those plants were directly affected. Um, and so what the gypsum does is that sulfur reacts with the magnesium and turns it into Epsom salts, basically. So it turns it into something that's very soluble and then the um, calcium that's in gypsum replaced that magnesium. So we changed our magnesium to calcium ratios, which starts to create a soil that's more open. Um, and then calcium is always gonna be a, a biological stimulant anyway. So helping just get a microbial workforce to, cause they're the ones that create structure. So it's, we're kind of in this catch 22 of we have compacted soils and there's plates and there's no air but it's biology that need to get in there. All right, maybe gypsum is a way to do that if you have very high magnesium or even um, gypsum is not going to help with potassium. 
But if you have very high potassium soils, you could potentially grow like a potassium loving crop and then harvest that crop and, and take it away. Um, Cause yeah, it can be quite tricky with high potassium. Um, but yeah, a lot of the times it's just getting, you know, calcium working, fungi working and open that soil up. And I, I, I do like, it feels like, you know, one of the first questions who someone very dilig diligently put in the Q&A is why regenerative and not sustainable? And I, um, yeah, well, you I think, you know, in my experience when talking about sustainable, um, a lot of the focus is on reducing inputs um, and, you know, how can you apply less herbicides? How can you apply less pesticides? But it doesn't always give solutions of how to mean that your plant actually does better. Um, mm -hmm. It's more just about how can you reduce what you're putting in or be more precise about it or that kind of thing. And yeah. I think everything you're talking about, Nicole, and to me, this is what's fundamentally different about regenerative, is you're talking about activating soil biology and the mechanisms of the biology in the soil and that that is what allows for the healthier plant and all of the everything to be back in balance. And then you don't mm. end up with disease issues and you don't end up with the same pest issues. And, and, and yeah, so I, it's great that you keep bringing it back to that soil biology and those little microorganisms. Um, mm. I don't know if you wanna say anything particularly about that side of things or. Well, I just think that the word sustainable doesn't mean anything anymore. Um, it got greenwashed which is already happening with regenerative as well, fast. But, you know, most New Zealand vines are grown under the sustainable vines label. You want to see the amount of glyphosate that's used out there. You want to see the health of those vines and the health of that soil. It doesn't mean anything. Uh, there's a sustainable beef project being run by McDonald's. It doesn't mean anything. They, when, they, when they introduced it to uh, Canada, I think like 97% of the beef farm has already met the sustainable measures, you know, so it's just language and it's just a word I'm not going to use because sustain means to maintain the same. And if we do that, we're not going to see future generations survive. Yeah, totally. Um, okay, so just, I recognize there's lots of questions there. I will come back to asking those in a second. Um, I wanted to ask um, you uh, that, in particular, if you wanted to shift away from a chemical-based system to a regenerative one, um, you are very good about offering transition solutions and, and you know, not going cold turkey, or I, I think you don't advise cold turkey. <laughs> um, so maybe you could tell us more about what some of those transition solutions might look like. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, again, don't tell anyone I said this, but we go on the methadone program. We want to look at if, it, if you're currently got a very high, let's say nitrogen use, or you're using a lot of pesticides um, or a lot of fungicides, there are biological replacements as such. So to go through that transition, sometimes we can pull one thing out and put something that's going to be less harmful in, in that transition until we can get vine health up. Because you just pull that out, your vines are not healthy, your soil's not healthy, and we just see yields drop and, and pretty major problems end up happening. Which I think is what kind of gave the organic industry a really bad name, you know, 20 odd years ago was this, we'll just pull the rug out, we're not gonna use any chemicals. Um, and so that's what I kind of like the regenerative thinking is we're thinking, there's no, it's not that we can't use any of these things. There's probably um, a few that I would never use. I like neonicotinoids, they need to be banned by the way, um, or uh, organophosphates again shouldn't be used um, but there are really good biologicals and we had this conversation with one of the UK groups and there is a product called metarhizium when that's not what the product's called but it's a it's a fungus that eats um, bad bugs basically it doesn't affect bees but it infects inside the bodies of insects so if you have got um, insect pressures well we've seen great results with mealybug um, then that might be a transition tool um, you know, so looking at, you know, what is it that I already currently are quite addicted to, um, and then how can I buffer it and reduce it? And so using these carbon-based materials, like I mentioned, you know, seaweeds and fishes and um, the fulvic, using those kind of buffers. And this is what we've come up against um, a lot of growers is like, well, what does that do to, um, let's say, 
you know, grape skin integrity, or is this going to stain it or anything like that? And the research really hasn't been done. And it makes it really nerve wracking for people wanting to try different things when you haven't kind of got the industry support. Um, and I think this is why we saw the New Zealand regenerative industry kind of plateau a bit was that there just wasn't that support. There's not the consultants um, yeah, out there to be able to kind of handhold. Um, and I think with you, the UK seems like it's still fairly new um, idea, which just still blows my mind. But anyway, um, having those people that can kind of walk you through carefully so that we're not going to risk something by, you know, staining your wine, making it purple when it's meant to be yellow. Um, not saying we've ever done that, but I know I've heard of people that, that had staining with humic acid um, and got their crop rejected. So there's just things to think about. And this is why, like, if you want to try milk or seaweed, just trial it on just a couple of plants. Like, don't go and do 100 hectares all at once and then find out that, oh, that product isn't compatible or there's something in my water that's antagonizing. Um, so I think, you know, and, and doing this collectively, I think is really valuable as well. So some, you know, some vineyards, you've got like 20 vineyards and, and as a collective, well, get each vineyard to try one different thing and um, yeah, give it a go. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Um, okay, I'm going to ask one final my question, and then I will go on to, we've got lots of questions in the Q&A. Um, so we're working, obviously, we're working in collaboration with you to extend the functionality of um, soil mentor and sector mentor. Um, sector mentor includes the soil health analysis stuff um, mm -hmm. with the regen platform. And yeah. I was hoping you could tell us a little bit more about what the regen platform is and why you're excited about it. Um, well, the region platform is a, it's a place that we can actually go and put all this monitoring information in. So if you are collecting information on maybe the sap of the vines or you're out digging holes, we have a place that on your phone that you could actually enter that information and, and really be able to benchmark and trend and see changes over time, or even, which is gonna be really cool, be able to compare to others in similar biomes. You know, what, what's happening with, if I got the worst earthworms in the world, or actually, no, no one's got earthworms in my biome. Okay, that's fine, I feel better. Um, and this, what I, I said earlier about Kokako is to have had that information, you know, like 14 years of just really dramatically changing soil. That soil was stuffed. Um, you know, I have really don't even have photographs. I'm like, what, what were you doing? I mean, there's so much that I would change. I mean, like as a first client, I was totally flying blind. I didn't have anyone that um, was kind of supporting me. Uh, so yeah, and, and the wheels didn't fall off. Yay. Um, <laughs> but I think to be able to, to benchmark those changes over time is so valuable because people don't believe you, you know, and they just go, ah, oh, no, it's always been good. Um, and it, it gives, if we're going to talk that we are regenerating, you need to have some kind of proof of concept of that. Otherwise, you're just greenwashing again. So, you know, are we truly regenerating our resources? And that includes, you know, finances or um, well-being. So that well-being stuff is really interesting to me. Um, I get a lot of feedback from growers saying how their stress levels have really dropped because they're not in this like daily warfare situation. Um, and they're not having to chase their tails and they're not just chasing symptoms and, and, you know, having things come out of the blue so they can actually relax and they can go on holidays and, you know, that's kind of neat. Like, I don't know if we could put that in as one of our soil mentor things. We're improving. I haven't yelled at the kids today. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. It's a good method. <laughs> um, okay. But, yeah. So looking at questions, um, I think, uh, this is an inter interesting question from Jonathan Aitken, which says, has this been tried in a vineyard site that's marginal for growing vines or how, how, you know, how does this work when vines are, you know, a marginal plant in a way? Yeah, I mean, I think it comes back to one of the soil health principles, which is context, you know, and I think, um, from my experience uh, with my dad planting avocados in an area that was marginal, um, we end up having to spend a bit more money. So we had to, in, we end up massive windbreaks and shelters in to, because it was, it was too cold and too windy really for avocados. And in the end, it, it was a success, but 
uh, we really did that through stimulating that microbiome. So our soils are warmer, the, the microclimate becomes better. So we're actually adjusting that context as such to make it better suited to, to vines, or to, in this case, avocados. Um, and also setting those vines up from the start so that we, we're doing that bio priming. So we're gonna make sure we've got something around that root ball when we're, when we're transplanting and something that's going to help inoculate microbiology on those leaf surfaces just to support them if it was marginal in terms of frost. There are organisms that eat the frost causing bacteria. We can lift bricks to reduce frost damage. Um, and just lifting overall health, we've seen some dramatic changes in frost susceptibility from 80% crop losses to 5% um, side by side is really cool. Um, so yeah, I mean, there, there's so much that we can do. You just, you're just going to have to be a lot more proactive, I think, if we're trying to push a plant to fit our needs. And maybe you should, yeah, be thinking about that. Yeah, and actually, frost is a major issue in the UK, um, mm. especially with more erratic climatic conditions. It's coming later, and then it can mm -hmm. really affect things. So, yeah, um, yeah, getting yeah. pro and or proactive on our frost is really, really important. I don't know if you have anything yeah. specific to say there or a reference. Uh, so there's an organism called Pseudomonas florensins that eats the frost causing bacteria, which is Pseudomonas syringae. Um, they come out of a worm's butt for some reason. So we, uh, so using um, worm extracts, vermicast um, or worm extracts as foliar sprays, or buying. So as a packaged product, that Pseudomonas florensins lasts for two months after a single application and it protects down to a minus six degree Celsius frost event. Um, and then by lifting bricks, so you're going to have more sugar instead of water. So there's less water to freeze. Um, makes a lot of sense. And we find that we're, we're making soils warmer because biology are getting it on. When you get it on, it gets warm. And so we're seeing soils that are warmer. Um, so that is also having an influence on just these little microclimates. So um, there's lots that we can do. You're not, you yeah. Got it. Yeah. Um, okay, and that kind of links to, um, well, your comment on Briar Priming kind of links to Harry's question here, which is if you're starting on fresh land that hasn't been under vines before, what's the best way to start to ensure you're on a regenerative path? Should you grow something to build fertility first and push your plants back a year or something along those lines? Yeah, I, I probably would actually. So uh, with some of the intensive nurseries I work on, we, we have that, I guess, cover crop fallow period before we even get started. So thinking um, species that are known to be very mycorrhizal, like oats, um, species that open up that compaction, that add a lot of organic matter, you know, sunflowers and um, buckwheat for its ability to release acids that will release bound nutrients. So, you know, really just setting that scene up. Um, but, you know, the, the putting in vines is, is incredibly disturbing and destructive for soil. So it says, you know, as quickly as possible, if we can um, start feeding fungi, so the wood chips, um, fungal compost, and I want it broadcast. I want, it, I, I want you to think about it as a whole environment, not just this little patch where we drip water and drip nutrients and you know like the, the vines root systems are going right across um in, the interro so you know putting compost across the whole thing Brilliant. um okay so i don't know how you know how much you know about specific root stocks or varietals but do you know are there any that are better suited to agroecological methods like this or regenerative methods it's a good question because it is something that um we have seen issues with predominantly in the apple industry um, is having rootstock um, and varieties that have no natural resilience at all, no natural resistance. So really thinking about, um, I couldn't give you rootstock. Um, a lot of these guys are just using normal conventional, and I can't remember. I, yeah, um, like I said, I'm just interested in the soil and it's lucky I get to work in a range of sectors, but I often feel like I'm a jack of all trades, master of none. Um, but the, the rootstock, I would really be thinking, does the, do, do, do these cultivars have a natural resistance or has that been bred out of them? Are they really good at joining up with mycorrhizae? It's been bred out of them. So we're seeing 
breeding strategies that are actually bypassing the microbial bridge. And that's a real big problem. Um, and I think more of the growers are starting to realize this and having more conversation um, with seed producers and rootstock producers around these need to be mycorrhizal. So River Sun that I work with in New Zealand, who are the largest rootstock nursery in the country, certify on mycorrhizal colonization, um, obviously before they dip it in chemicals and sell it to you, but, <laughs> but it has mycorrhizal colonization in the field. So, uh, and that, that's been prompted from their awareness of soil health, but also because growers were asking for it. So I think it's, it's a collective again, in terms of we want varieties that can really stand up naturally that aren't needing to be chemically propped up because we want to make some money. That would be nice. <laughs> <laughs> um, so in the very beginning, you said you talked about the undervine mowing had been the way forward at Kokako. Mm -hmm. Oh gosh. Anyway, um, so Francisco asks, how does undervine mowing work? And what about using like livestock like sheep to control cover crops? Is that feasible in vines in Europe? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I, I, I'd like to see more people using sheep. And again, with those, you can either, either use the grazing muzzles or you can train sheep to not eat vines so some people want them for plucking but you so those ones you wouldn't train not to eat vines but you can train um so there's a website called behave.org um that has the training protocols on how to train sheep to eat things or to not eat things so you can you can do some cool stuff with with grazing i'd love to see more sheep under vines um obviously you know it depends on your trellis system or like how much damage they could do um but yeah, and then there are some really innovative mowers out there now um, that, you know, can really get around the posts and get around the vines without doing any damage. So I, I don't know the names of them. Um, yeah. yeah. But, um, <laughs> and then um, Aaron asks, are there connections between bacterial soils and increased insect pest populations? Yes. Yep. Um, very clearly. And the reason for that is we see less um, mobility of calcium in particular with bacterial soils because who makes calcium available and functional is, is your beneficial fungi. Um, so anytime we have low calcium in the system, then we're affecting cell wall structure um, and we're affecting the complexing of um, amino acids and proteins. And those are your dinner bell basically for insects. So if we don't have complex nitrogen forms then this is what attracts insect pests. There's also some relationships with some trace elements like boron, um, molybdenum, but the, yeah, the, the challenge really is, is to support vine health. And if it's very bacterial, we just see a breakdown in, um, we see an increase in free nitrates, which then create growth. So we get a lot of vigor but that it's just sweet, tasty stuff for insects. Um, so just, yeah, that would be the main concern, I think, with bacterial soils and poor disease suppression as well. Um, great. So Adam can I, ask, it, can I answer the question on the honey fungus? Oh yeah, sweet. go for it. Um, anytime we're looking at some kind of fungal diseases, take a look and what's fascinating is most of them are saprophytic, which means they eat dead stuff. So the honey fungus is not your primary, and like Phytophthora, which we have in causing rampant trouble in New Zealand, it's secondary, right? It's not the primary vector. There was something else that enabled that saprophyte to then get into your vines to start eating them because that vine's basically dying. So get interested in what is, ha what is happening with my sap. Like use those sap meters. So I use um, the twin Cardi. I, I use a, a company called Hariba. H-O-R-I-B-A for my meters and um, yeah, start testing. Um, if that, if you are interested in the, in the meters, I can send you, I'll send Abby a chart that just lays out what should those desired ranges be? What are we looking for for optimal health? Um, and what you see is there's something happening before you're getting the honey fungus um, or the am amylaria. And we have had absolutely brilliant results um, with amylaria in greenhouses with the use of high fungal compost tea. So doing um, multiple applications of um, basically yeah, biological extracts, so your compost extracts. Um, in those days I used to do teas and that did work really well, but I actually prefer an extract just as a clarification, but it 
<laughs> it was very effective. Um, okay, I realize we only have a few minutes left, so I'm going to try and quick fire some questions here. In the case study, how many spray rounds were done in the year and how large was the sprayer? Do you know that? Um, he's got a couple of different sprayers. Uh, there's probably some stuff if you go, uh, follow him on Instagram, Kokako Farms, um, and you can see some of that stuff. I couldn't give you the number of sprays these days. Um, okay. And, and I've got it in another PowerPoint, but I can't pull it up right in front of me. But yeah, this spray, this spray, the amount that they're spraying and the number of passes has significantly gone down. Like I said, oh, his fuel bill, like just fuel went down by 20%. So that kind of gives you an indicator to, um, yeah, the reduction in passes, even though they're now doing nutritional or soil drenches or whatever, um, there's still a decrease in fuel use. Um, and then Cameron asks, you say you don't subsoil, but some vineyards have very compacted rows. Surely subsoiling in some instances will help bring life back to the soil. Yeah, do it once off and then address why you have compaction. Right. And as you said, like by putting the correct stuff down in the trench or whatever that's created, that's the way mm -hmm. that you prevent it from having to be done again and again, or that's part of it. Yeah. It? Yeah. And that's that chasing your tail conventional mentality like we're just going to continue the same thing every year instead of going oh I wonder why we have this problem let's address it yeah. you know and, and we don't have to go down three feet right so you do that as your single year one and then um, start addressing those factors and then if it's still not working I mean you do a shallow aeration to get water and water in filtrating but yeah Okay. It's a big disturbance that subsoil ripping. Yeah. Okay, and final question that I can see here um, is, Graham, how long does it take for compaction to clear if I just stop driving up and down my rows? Um, if you go back to the five M's, if management was the reason that you have compaction, then it could be quite quick. But if it's because of the other four, then it could be really slow. Um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and in my experience, um, Compaction is really, really difficult to shift. It doesn't shift that quickly on its own. In my experience, um, it takes uh, active, proactive approaches and cover crops and all different things to make that change, mm -hmm. really. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so um, thank you so much, everyone, for your questions. I'm sorry we've not got through all of them. Uh, they just keep coming in. <laughs> um, so some of them are quite specific, like, you know, what is the name of something? We can answer that. Uh, in a follow-up, um, but really appreciate everyone tuning in. Thank you so much, Nicole, for everything you've shared. Like, it is really fascinating. And, it, and you know, this is just the beginning. We could never cover everything in this time. Um, and the idea really was to spark conversations and to get people thinking in a different way and start asking questions and, you know, do Nicole's course, read her book. Um, it really is like good detailed knowledge about everything we've been talking about. Yeah. Um, and yeah, if you're interested to hear more about Sector Mentor in the Regen platform, uh, you can send us a DM in the chat here on Zoom now, or just send us an email, info at vitacycle.com, we'll get back to you. Um, we're going to send a follow-up email on Friday with the video of these recordings, um, and we'll send links to Nicole's book and the course. And then tomorrow, same time, please do tune in for the chat with Regen Ben. Um, we'll be going through some of the experiments he's been doing on his grapevines in the UK. Sounds exciting. Yeah. So thank you so much, Nicole. Really, really appreciate it. My pleasure. Um, Thanks for great questions, everybody. Very excited to see regenerative ag take off in the UK. Go. <laughs> all right. Toodaloo. Thanks all. Thanks.